Let's go ahead and bring him over, Jonathan Small, the editor of Entrepreneur. Uh, wow, I sound very, uh, I feel like a field reporter there. Uh, editor of Entrepreneur. Um, keep hey. letting me know, and I have no field reporter background. <laughs> How are you, Jonathan? Good to see good. you. Good, good to see you, Elliot. Oh, it's, I'm glad to have you here. I'm going to hop off and let you go ahead and introduce your panelists. I'm very excited for this one. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much. And Welcome panelists. I think you're all here. This is the Canadian Catalysts panel. And um, my name is John Small and I'm with Green Entrepreneur uh, Magazine, greenentrepreneur.com. And it is a pleasure to talk to you even this early in the morning. I'm in LA, it's um, now seven in the morning. So I am drinking lots of coffee um, and excited though to talk to my panelists. It looks like um, they're almost all here. Um, Guys, I think I'll let you introduce yourselves and talk about who you are and what, what you do at your wonderful company. So um, let's start there. So let's start with um, Mikkel Rutherford. Welcome to the panel and let us know a little bit about yourself and, and what you do over at Slang Worldwide. Thanks. Yeah. Pleasure to be here, John. Um, it's just Mike. It's just spelled weird for, for no good reason at all. Uh, so I'm yeah, Mike sorry, Rutherford, Mike. No, no problem at all. This is, uh, this is what happens at six in the morning in uh, Los <laughs> yeah. Angeles. Sorry. No worries. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm CFO of Slang Worldwide, a leader in uh, cannabis consumer packaged goods. Uh, we've got six distinct top performing brands in multiple verticals. We operate in 14 states, Canada, Puerto Rico, and abroad. Uh, I was previously the director of finance for uh, AgriFarm, and I'm now a, a member of the board there. And that's a Canadian LP, uh, which is a joint venture between Slang, Canopy Growth, and uh, Greenhouse Seed Company. Oh, you're on mute there, John. Welcome to the panel, uh, everyone, and thank you for, uh, for clearing that up. John, uh, <laughs> since you are so politely... <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me know about my mute button. Tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is John Arbuthnot. I'm the CEO of uh, Delta 9 Cannabis uh, uh, here in Winnipeg. Uh, three main business groups uh, under the Delta 9 Cannabis umbrella. Firstly, we're uh, health candle licensed uh, uh, for cultivation, processing, extraction, and wholesale distribution uh, across six provincial markets touching uh, uh, upwards of 25 million uh, Canadian consumers with Delta 9 branded uh, cannabis flower pre-rolls, uh, kind of the full suite of, of consumer packaged cannabis products here in Canada. Uh, we're also a licensed retailer. Uh, we're currently operating 10 bricks and mortar retail stores, uh, as well as online across three provincial markets uh, and expanding our retail store chain up to 20 stores this calendar year. And we operate a business to business segment. Uh, we sell all our proprietary growing equipment. Uh, we provide consulting and licensing services to other licensed and pre-licensed cannabis businesses. Uh, shares trade on the main board Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol DN. Terrific. Welcome to the panel. And last but not least, Joel, welcome. Uh, let us, first of all, it looks like there's some sort of fire going on behind you. So. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> there's a, either it's the steam coming off the grass or you need to evacuate immediately. Uh, yeah, it's, but it's, welcome, uh, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I'm a little north of you. I'm here in uh, Vancouver, BC. It's a, you can see outside the window, uh, I'm working from home, obviously, for COVID reasons, but it's a, uh, a beautiful, clear, sunny day here in Vancouver, but it's cold outside. In fact, we had snow on the ground yesterday, so... Uh, I think what you're seeing is the venting from uh, my heating system here. Okay. <laughs> right. I, yeah, okay. For my right shoulder there. So either anyway, that or somebody's I'm, enjoying a bong outside. <laughs> it could be that as well. <laughs> be that as well. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm the CEO of Christina Lake Cannabis, and uh, Christina Lake is uh, uh, where our our uh, facility, which is uh, one of the largest outdoor grow facilities in all of Canada. Uh, is located it's uh, in South Central British Columbia, just above the U.S. border, and uh, we started about two and a half years ago, and we built out a world-class uh, facility uh, where we have a 35-acre property where we're growing cannabis outdoors. Um, we also have a uh, indoor cultivation building, and we have a uh, purpose-built uh, uh, processing and extraction facility that uh, we've built at site. Uh, so we turned in our first crop uh, this uh, past year, 
I had a very, very successful uh, crop uh, generated around 35,000 kilos of uh, cannabis biomass. And uh, we've been turning that into uh, oils and uh, distillates uh, for sale uh, within the uh, Canadian marketplace. So uh, the company is listed here in Canada um, under the symbol C uh, under the uh, Lit on the excuse me the CSE under the uh, symbol uh, CLC uh, and uh, it's also listed in the U.S. on the OTC under the symbol CLC FF John. Great. Well, welcome to the panel. Let's Thank you. Uh, before we dive into this topic of cost cutting and consolidation, let's talk about this past year, 2020. Um, what you guys uh, witnessed in the Canadian market? I just got a, a news alert that. Actually, uh, sales were up 120 percent in Canada in 2020. So, despite all that was happening in the world, um, the Canadian uh, cannabis market seems to be flourishing. What is your take on on you know the the market in Canada this past year? Maybe I'll lead lead that off, John. Sure, uh, John. You know, from from our side and, and kind of participating in multiple verticals uh, here in Canada. I mean. You know, we were fortunate when things really started to get scary last March. Uh, we learned, you know, quite early on from multiple levels of government that our operations would be considered essential um, for, for cultivation, for retail, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, so I, I consider ourselves quite fortunate that, you know, there haven't been government mandated shutdowns of facilities and, and things like that, which uh, you know, for cannabis to have gone from illegal to essential here in Canada and you know, within the scope of a few years, I, I think is quite remarkable. But, you know, to then see the continued acceleration of the market, as you mentioned, uh, you know, I, I think retail sales have been up almost month over month uh, throughout all of, of 2020 uh, in terms of the, the figure stats uh, tracked by Stats Can. Uh, so, you know, we're we're seeing more people now in, in the Canadian market starting to participate in in legal cannabis, They're moving away from uh, from the black market. I, th I think there's been a lot of positive takeaways uh, from that. Obvious challenges come with with running your operations through COVID. I mean, you know, physical distancing in production spaces and processing areas, uh, retail stores. You know, installing plexiglass barriers and hand sanitizer, and uh, you know, taking all those steps to keep customers and, and staff safe. Uh, through all of that. So it has certainly not come without challenges, but uh, I, again, consider ourselves fortunate that, that we've been able to operate through all this and, and continue to grow. Mike, what, what, what did you see over the past year over at Slang Worldwide? Yeah, I, I mean, I echo a, a lot of what John said. I mean, we obviously had a little thing called COVID happen in, in uh, 2020, which, uh, you know- Wait, what's that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, so, I mean, it impacted things similarly, like John said, but, you know, on top of that, um, you know, 2018, 2019, you saw, you know, a lot of, a lot of money raised, a lot of money come into the space, a lot of companies go public, that obviously slowed pretty dramatically. Uh, in, in 2020, you know, the capital markets tightened, and it was a year where, you know, I think a lot of companies had to take a step back and look at what assets they had either built or had acquired over the course of the last couple of years and, and try to make the best of, of kind of what they had. Uh, for the period. And, and that's what, uh, you know, specifically AgriFarm who operates in Canada. I mean, that's, that's what we did at AgriFarm. You know, we were positioned, uh, you know, don't have the, the same, not quite as much space as Joel has, but, uh, but AgriFarm sits on 20 acres. Uh, also got an outdoor cultivation license in 20, 2019. And, and that allowed us to, <clears throat> excuse me, significantly, you know, decrease our raw material costs uh, in 2020, which was, was uh, you know, extremely, extremely, extremely helpful. Um, also, you know, AgriFarm hadn't, hasn't taken any new debt or, or equity in since 2017. So, you know, we really had to rely on, on the scrappiness of the sales team and leveraging partnerships. Uh, and one of the things we did was uh, that we were able to do is through the, through the Slang network, AgriFarm was able to leverage the inside sales team of Slang, which is essentially a team set up to drive sales to retail. Uh, and we felt that was a, you know, that was a, a great competitive advantage for us in order, you know, to be able to get, uh, you know, products on shelves uh, in Canada. So, you know, a, a great example of that is our, our Firefly Mini, which basically went from a standing start in, in December to being a top five disposable vape pen um, now. So, you know, being able to leverage the assets that we have, the, the team um, that we have in partnerships allowed us to, you know, fight through a pretty difficult year. Joel, do you echo some of these... Um observations, Steve, similar experience? 
I, I certainly do, uh, John. I think John and uh, Mike both, you know, point out a lot of the dynamics that we've seen within the industry. I mean, if you look back um, over the last two or three years since legalization in Canada, you had, you know, just a massive uh, rocket ship initially with cannabis companies. And then, of course, uh, the hangover that uh, came with it and a correction and a downward spiral for a period of time. Uh, we missed that. We were in construction. We weren't yet public. So we missed a lot of that phase. I think our timing has been very fortunate in the sense that uh, you know, our, our facility has been complete. We've started to uh, produce product and we've listed our shares all within the last six months. So we missed some of that uh, pain and uh, some of the tough learning uh, curve that, uh, that was there. But the two things that we've been uh, you know, really uh, focused on and, and watching within the Canadian landscape uh, are, um, and, and Jonathan touched, John touched on it, which was uh, the, the black market. That was, that's been a difficult situation in Canada. On one hand, you have the uh, licensed producers like the three of us uh, who are trying to do it in a highly regulated, legalized environment with all the additional costs that come with that. And you have another industry that exists in the periphery where they don't have those costs and they don't have those regulations. And uh, you've got to compete head to head with them. Uh, so, so that was a challenge. I'll come back to that in a moment. Second thing uh, is a uh, lack of distribution of uh, retail outlets, um, which uh, John uh, touched on as well. Uh, the government was quick in licensing production, but it was much slower in licensing distribution. And the government uh, through Health Canada, which uh, governs the uh, cannabis industry in Canada, has since recognized that they've begun to really accelerate the openings in Ontario and Quebec, the two largest provinces in Canada. And that's really starting to filter through and having a positive, positive impact in terms of uh, you know, access for uh, customers, particularly um, on the recreational side to products. So that's helping to alleviate some of the bottlenecks in the industry. And then going back to the first part uh, problem, which was the, the black market. Um, one of the advantages that we have uh, with Christina like cannabis is that by being one of the lowest cost producers in Canada, in fact, our costs are typically about 10 to 20% of what an indoor producer or greenhouse producer would be producing at. So very, very low cost. Uh, not only are we cheaper than them, but we're also considerably cheaper than the black market uh, because of course the black market can't grow outdoors on large scale, but we're, we're able to do that. So um, you know, we've, we've been uh, uh, very fortunate and successful in, in being able to offset uh, some of those challenges. Let's talk about, you know, what happens in Canada so much predicts what's going to happen in the rest of the world. And you guys were so quick, to, uh, you know, have been one of the pioneers in legalization. But with that, we've seen a lot of changes, cost cutting, you know, after sort of the ebullience of excitement of legalization, you know, companies across the sector have have been forced to do some cost cutting, and I would love John to start with you. You know, what what is your take on 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 that um, on cost cutting in the industry? No, certainly, and I, I think things have really come full circle. And you know, to expand on on Mike's point uh, from from the last question, you know, I think COVID really <clears throat> you know accelerated that focus toward. Um, you know, rationalizing cost structure and, and where it, capital markets may not necessarily be immediately available to companies, you know, figuring out how do we do, uh, how do we create a profitable business with the asset base that we have and, and really demonstrate uh, a, a responsibility for shareholders. But, you know, f for us, I, I think this process started at, at Delta 9, uh, you know, immediately in the wake of legalization. Um, you know, we, we, uh, there, there was real get it done attitude before legalization. I mean, if you, if you need to open a store on a fixed date for uh, October 17th, 2018, uh, you, you throw every resource you have at it and, and marketing and advertising for that launch and uh, getting facilities ramped up and, and building supply chains and, and all of those components. There, there was, a, you know, an, an amazing effort, I think, across the sector and, and, and the teams at, at respective LPs and retailers to ramp things up over the last few years. And, you know, now with the dust settling on the first inning uh, here in Canada, it's it's time to take that look in the mirror. Again, I, I would say COVID has accelerated that, but now companies really taking a hard look at SGNA, uh, really taking a hard look at, at things like cost per gram or, or key performance indicators in retail, like 
uh, wages and salaries as percentage of revenues, things like that. So you're starting to dial in those factors that are ultimately going to drive competition. They're, they're going to drive prices down. And, and I, I think what investors are wanting to see in the second inning and, and beyond is, is demonstrated profitability from the Canadian market, that this has been the quickest market to evolve uh, in, in terms of a G20 nation toward federal legalization. Uh, can there be profitable businesses built? Uh, can we displace black market, you know, to, to Joel's point, based on cost competition and, and the competitive factors in terms of product development and, and value propositions? So I, I think cost cutting, uh, you know, across the board, it, it's played a main part of the narrative for a lot of, of major and, and all the way uh, up and down the, uh, the ladder in terms of market cap uh, for companies in the space. But I, I think will continue to be important moving forward as you now start to see other international markets uh, start to seriously pursue legalization. Mike, what's your take on 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 uh, the cost cutting across the Canadian market? Yeah, I mean, I, I echo what John says as well too. I mean, if you haven't been focusing on on profitability, you know, for the last couple of years, um, you know, you're going to be left behind. Uh, you've got to get to to that that point of of being able to show in you know your shareholder base that there's going to be return on their dollars. So, um, you know, and, and we you know we have a I'm sure like the rest of the guys on the panel, you know, we try to run a pretty lean organization uh, in terms of OPEX. Um, and, you know, we have a, you know, just functional things. We have a, you know, systematic process on a quarterly basis to review all costs and, and vendor relationships to make sure that we're, you know, running, you know, as lean as possible. But, you know, in particular, a couple of things that we've done that, that were pretty helpful uh, in 2020, which once again, you know, it's, it's necessity kind of breeds innovation and COVID accelerated that, I would say, um, to, to be creative in, in looking at where you can uh, generate some cost savings. You know, a couple of our biggest expenses, um, you know, hydro, a portion of our, our production is indoor. So hydro is a big expense for us. We worked with a, an energy consultant and uh, through them, we were able to access some credits that we previously hadn't. And it, it, it turned out to be a pretty sizable refund for us, which was a great initiative. And we also put a an energy plan in place, which is is creating cost savings savings on the hydro front on an annual basis of, of over a hundred grand. So, you know, just a, a great win ultimately uh, for the company utilizing, uh, you know, that consultant. And another thing is is our team. You know, uh, people make a company, and uh, we invested we invested in our team. And when I say that, what I mean is we we you know cross trained a lot of our staff. And we created that competency to be proficient in a number of different areas of the business. And that for us created a lot of efficiency, whether it be just scheduling, um, but more importantly, you know, having that, you know, ability to have cross ownership of, of functionality uh, in different aspects of the business ultimately results in a, in a cost savings in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the human capital deployed. So, you know, our team is a is a, it's a huge part of what we do and and we invested in though in them so you know those are two specific things that were that were wins for us yeah joel um similar experience i mean what what have you guys had to do in, in terms of cost cutting um as, as we as we know it's it's something that it's a reality for every company now um there's no shame in it <laughs> yeah being a late entry uh into the marketplace uh john and uh you know, we were fairly lean when we started. Uh, we didn't have the, uh, the benefit of the heady days where, uh, you know, cannabis companies were living high on the hog. So, you know, we, we recognized that we had to be pretty lean when we started. I've been involved personally in cannabis now for two and a half years. And, uh, you know, I've never taken a single paycheck. Every, all my pay has been through equity. And, and that's the case with my senior management team. Uh, we take our pay in equity, uh, so that we're aligned with our shareholders and uh, you know that's that's one of the uh, considerations we've done for uh, trying to uh, maintain our costs and to keep our costs clean. The other things that we've done, uh, we've really tried to strive to introduce technology where we can use technology to automate what is you know still farming. And uh, an example of that was that we were finding that trying to monitor, 25,000 plants, individual plants over 25 acres is, you know, daunting at best and uh, requires a lot of man hours, literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of man hours going out, checking plants, making sure they're well watered and so on. So we went searching for technology. We found a very innovative drone technology out of China that we brought over to Canada. And if you can imagine this out in the middle of our 
uh, field. Uh, we have a little airport uh, with a little tower and it controls three or four drones that basically fly our property uh, when we're uh, cultivating. And uh, it takes thermal images and can determine if, uh, if there uh, are sections of the field that are under duress, not getting enough water, getting too much water, uh, not getting enough nutrition, getting too much nutrition, uh, under attack by uh, pests, that type of thing. So um, that helped uh, to significantly lower our costs. Um, right now in our extraction building, we're introducing a very leading edge uh, technology that uh, we've been beta testing with uh, a company called Vitalis that makes extraction equipment that is going to uh, almost uh, threefold increase our throughput uh, on our CO2 extractors. So. Uh, dramatically uh, increases the volume output of our end product. So those types of things uh, we've been uh, doing to try and lower our costs and keep uh, very, very competitive. Now shift to um, another trend that we're seeing, and that is the consolidation uh, and M&A across the Canadian market. Wonder, John, we'll start with you again, your take on it, um, sort of the challenges, um, both the benefits and the challenges of a consolidation uh, in the market, if you could, if you could share your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, c- consolidation, and, and we've been speaking to this for, you know, over the last twelve months. Uh, I mean, I, we see it as, as very essential, and in, in particularly in the Canadian space. You know, as, as we all know, there was an e- explosion in the number of companies participating in the space, and that that overall sense that that this would ultimately be the the green rush <laughs> uh, here in Canada. And, um, you know, as, as much as we're, we're very bullish on the opportunities for, for profitability, uh, et cetera, in the Canadian space, that, that explosion, the number of, of companies and competitors has created challenges. Uh, in terms of the number of publicly traded companies here in Canada, I, I think there's still over 200 uh, operating in the space. And, and this is a, you know, call it a 10 billion a year uh, in annualized revenue run rate industry. So for, for any industry that that's a large number of publicly traded companies and, and not to mention all the private uh, entities within the space. So, you know, I, I think in the context, even of our, our previous comments around cost cutting, you know, you, you look at consolidation then as an opportunity towards building scale, uh, getting to a size uh, for these companies that, that you're able to do things that, that smaller players just are not. Uh, we have taken some first steps uh, in 2020 uh, in terms of retail acquisitions. We added uh, actually five uh, stores. So we more than doubled our store count from uh, from four to nine over the last calendar year. Three of those store openings were uh, acquisition based. Uh, I see a huge opportunity for a roll up in retail assets uh, in, in terms of um, uh, quickly expanding our, our retail chain uh, through acquisition. Uh, and as, as a retailer builds scale, that builds again, more opportunity to work with uh, producers and manufacturers uh, to, to build shelf space awareness, to build uh, that, that promotional presence, uh, and, and again, to build scale to a point where profitability becomes that much easier. So w- we see consolidation as an opportunity. We see it as essential. Uh, I think that combination of cost cutting and, um, and consolidation will be key uh, in terms of the next phase of growth for, uh, for the cannabis marketplace. And, you know, then you speak to challenges. It's, uh, you know, Valuations can be a challenge. Uh, bringing in different management teams working together can be a challenge. Uh, you know, uh, alignment of of interests between shareholders of different companies, and and you know, what's the overall capital structure? I mean, it, it, you you could yeah. almost foresee there's endless opportunity here for consolidation and almost endless right. challenges. Uh, but we are yeah. starting to see momentum in that now. Whether it's Hexo, Zenibus, more recently, Afria, Tilray, uh, High Tide, Meta, you're starting to see that consolidation happen. Uh, and I think it, it may not be a wave. Uh, it'll be a continuing, uh, continuing beat of the drum, uh, if you will, of, of consolidation uh, moving forward in the space. So we have five minutes left. I want to give uh, Mike and Joel a chance to weigh in on consolidation, really, and also your predictions for kind of what you see happening in 2021 and beyond in the, in the market here. Mike, uh, we'll start with you. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to just jump in quick and Joel, the uh, the the drone technology sounds. Yeah. Incredible. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of consolidation um, I, I think, you know, uh, we haven't seen this, you know, yet in Canada quite to the same degree that we've seen in other, in other markets, but like John pointed to, I mean, you're seeing, you know, snippets of that starting. And I think that that drum beat is going to continue to push forward, you know, Hexwell acquiring Xenobus 
hits, you know, a few, a few big transactions as of late as well. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, we will continue to see that um, some of the challenges, uh, you know, I think uh, there's been, you know, from, from raising funds uh, and growing quickly, there's, you know, unique financing structures that exist in the marketplace right now. There's also, you know, the balance sheet for some companies are not that clean. There's, you know, some, there's convertible debt, there's, you know, some interesting things there. So, um, you know, there's, there's things like that that need to be solved for in terms of cleaning up balance sheets before I think some companies will ultimately be able to be consolidated and will be good tar targets. So a lot of that, you know, uh, largely revolves around cleaning up the balance sheet, um, you know, whether that be assets or equity. And, and similarly, you know, the funds that were raised a lot of times we're put into some pretty big assets, whether it be cultivation or, or uh, you know, um, greenhouses, for example. And some of those assets are now redundant. Um, so, you know, consolidating performing assets is, is hard. Consolidating uh, redundant assets is even more difficult. So um, I think, you know, those will be some of the challenges that need to be overcome. Um, and I'll, I'll, I guess, stop there and, and pass yeah. it off to Joel. Yeah. Joel, you, you get the last word here. Um, predictions for, for, for 2021, what are you, what are you, uh, what is your, um, drone's eye view of, of the market? Uh, good stuff. Uh, well, uh, I'll just touch very, very briefly on consolidation. I mean, our, our, our story is kind of a, a natural outdoor sun grown product. Um, no pesticides, no insecticides, a very, very clean product. That's, that's basically our story. So what we've done is we've uh, try to identify acquisition candidates that are consistent with that story. We've been in discussions, for example, with uh, some companies that are in the, uh, the food products business. They're putting cannabis THC into food products and they're looking for a supplier. Uh, so we've been in discussions with them because, you know, they have the same, um, you know, the same mantra, uh, the same values as, as our company. So that's really driven our, um, consolidation uh, view and, and uh, acquisition view of what we've been up, up to, uh, Jonathan. And as far as you know, going forward, boy, what's I think really going to be the big game changer here over the next number of months is going to be legalization in the U.S. and what that means vis-a-vis -vis Canada. We've been positioning ourselves uh, to um, take advantage of that, uh, whether it, uh, we do that by ultimately selling product into the U.S. when that opportunity avails itself or whether we actually uh, make a move into the U.S. Uh, and uh, duplicate what we've been doing in Canada, uh, but do it in the U.S. where we see obviously a much larger market and, uh, and greater opportunity. So I think that's going to be really exciting and uh, interesting to watch over the next 12 months. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to share your wisdom with us and your outlook. And I wish you continued success with your various endeavors. And uh, Elliot, I pass it back to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Awesome panel, you guys. Uh, great to hear from the Canadian side. We keep talking about Canadian versus US and it's so nice to get uh, a weighted voice here uh, for Canadian companies. So again, thank you, uh, Slang, Delta 9, Christina Lake, and the one and only Jonathan Small. Uh, we will talk to you guys soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone.